So I'm very excited. Um, today we're going to be featuring uh, Gary Levinson, our artistic director. When I say our, I mean the Chamber Music Society Fort Worth artistic director. He's also the senior principal concertmaster, associate concertmaster of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And he has been a huge driving force behind um, our programming and our concert season. And he's also a huge driving force behind our education programs. So we're going to begin with a brief little interview. You'll get to know uh, Gary, and then we'll have a master class portion. And then you, the audience, will get a chance to talk to Gary. So let me introduce Gary Levinson. Thank you very much. Before we get started, I'd like to thank personally Misha Galaganov and all of the faculty and staff at TCU. We're really, really fortunate to be at this wonderful auditorium where we get to make music at times. Um, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful collaboration between the Chairman of Music Society of Fort Worth and Texas Christian University, and we really appreciate it. I think you will see both from this program and from the other events that take place here that this is a great educational institution, and the honor is ours. Thank you for hosting us. Um, what we're going to do about learning with the masters and the whole idea of learning with the masters is to personalize the people that you see on stage during concerts. And one of the reasons that we are doing it as the Chamber Music Society is we believe that the education per se is not just practicing in your room or going to concerts. It's really a lot of events such as this which make our imagination as students and as teachers really, really make, make, make it vital. And one of the things that I'd like to do with this segment of Learning with the Masters is to speak about the experiences that maybe that I have had when I was your age, the student's age, and how that sort of influenced my life as an artist and as a human being. So as I mentioned, Gary is our artistic director. It's an interesting position. So Gary, can you start by talking about what exactly you do in that role and what skills you bring that are necessary to be successful as an artistic director uh, in addition to being a performer? Well, there are many skills for artistic directors, but I think one of the most important skills are interpersonal skills. Now, one of the jobs of the artistic director is, of course, to put on compelling programs. And I always think about, well, what does it mean to put on a compelling program? So to some people, it's a lot of really famous works we know. So conceivably, we could be playing great chamber music by Beethoven for the entire season. And there would be nothing wrong with that, except that does not make, in my opinion, a great series. A great series is a journey of compositions married to players that basically get us involved in the music. And so when I look at the season that we have, we have a seasonal theme. We have, sometimes we will commemorate certain events in history. Sometimes we will celebrate those events. Sometimes events in our own lives that involve, um, you know, Sometimes it could be something as, as somber as death, and sometimes it could be something celebratory. So what we try to do, what I try to do when I put the season together, is to take a look at what's happening a year, two, three years in advance, and then to sort of sculpt the season around that. Now, sometimes, with the very best intentions, certain things don't work out. And one of the things that I have is a long list of what happens if. So if someone is unable to perform, well, what happens next? If a certain piece of music, let's say new music, it doesn't, becomes unavailable, what can we do to make sure that the theme of the concert is still adhered to? And so that the audience's reaction to us is not, well, what would it have been had it been X, Y, Z? Instead, what we try to do is to say, well, what is it when I'm in my chair? And I know as a performer, oftentimes we will go to concerts and kind of scratch our heads and go, it looked great on paper, I don't feel it though, and what's wrong with that? And what I try to do is I try to analyze why is it that something like that had happened. Um, I think at times, many times we'll go to concerts and we can't follow the theme of the concert even if it says this is about X, Y, Z. And so what I try to do is I look at it from the audience's perspective. Why is it that we have piece A? Why is it that we have piece B following that? Am I putting the best players with the works that actually showcase their best talents. 
And so it's, it's kind of a combination of many things, but in, in, a, in a way it's sort of a rolling dialogue between the artistic director, the board, and um, the artists that we're able to engage to make sure that we really put on the best concert possible. I think you had a brief example of um, an unexpected uh, musician shortage that we had this week. You want to talk really quickly about how you address that and how often those things happen? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of things happen oftentimes people can become indisposed. Um, we had a tragic thing happen to us last year where um, one of the members of the Vermeer Quartet had tragically passed away. And so what, what we have to do with, with stuff like that is we have to recover immediately and we have to look at the list of people who are capable and available. Now what most people don't think about is, you know, if I could have a magic wand and say, can you do it? And the answer would be 100% yes, and then it'd be really easy to do my job. But unfortunately, the way the music world works now, and this is a little bit from the business of music annals, is that people are overextended as a matter of fact. And what happens is that they make commitments 16, 18, 24 months in advance. And one of the things that's very difficult is if you want an artist who is a major performing artist, oftentimes he may be for a week in Singapore. And if I need him for two days here or for four days there, well, he's not going to be able to fly out from Singapore to join us, unfortunately. So oftentimes I have to make calls to three, four, five, six different people, all of whom are going to be very qualified to do something, and then be able to hopefully, you know, if the person is capable of doing the repertoire, if this is something that they're interested in, if it's something that they've played in the past, that's another thing that, you know, oftentimes we'll have great artists, but they'll honestly tell me, look, I don't have this piece in my fingers, you know, if I have to substitute for somebody and walk in on a professional chamber music concert, I need to be able to do this. And so it's, it's a lot of balancing in it. Alright. Well, Gary, take a minute to tell us about uh, your background. I've caught you at parties speaking fluent Russian. That surprised me. You don't, you don't look Russian, but I do believe that it's some of your heritage. And some of your relatives are also professional musicians, if I understand. Well, my journey here is, is somewhat convoluted. I was born in the Soviet Union because I'm really old. And the Soviet Union um, was, was a great place actually if you were going to be in the arts because first of all the education there from the very beginning was, was rather regimented which meant that you were not really allowed to play you know, by ear or not to have the scales and the arpeggios and all of the things that we now know are really important and work really well as a foundation for music. And so I was born in St. Petersburg and my family emigrated to the United States when I was 10 years old. My father is one of the most famous double bass players. If you were with us last year, you may have heard him in the Dvorak String Quintet. Um, he has subsequently just retired from the New York Philharmonic where he served for 25 years as their principal double bass player. And so upon immigration, when my father became principal double bass player of the Minnesota Orchestra, I started studying here in the United States with, with the then concertmaster of the Minnesota Orchestra, Lee Foley, and um, basically stayed in Minnesota for until I was the age of 17 at which point I went to the Juilliard School and got my <clears throat> both undergrad and graduate degrees there with Dorothy DeLay, the famed pedagogue of Isaac Perlman, Gil Shaham, Sarah Chang, and joined the New York Philharmonic at the age of 21, which was a long story we won't get into now, but suffice it to say, I never thought that I would have the opportunity to work in one of the world's great orchestras when I was just out of school and really playing international competitions and performing mostly as a soloist. Um, but one of the things that was really fantastic in my tenure at the Philharmonic was my love for chamber music because all of my colleagues, especially the ones that maintain dual careers where they play as orchestra musicians, at times section leaders or even the concertmaster, but all of them had incredible love for chamber music and the importance of understanding that if your chamber music playing and your orchestra playing are really one and the same. The skills are one and the same. You just need to apply them in different areas. But the idea of listening, the idea of working together as a team, the idea of give and take is the same whether you're playing a piano quartet or a duo as an auto recital or if you're playing Mahler too. Those skills you have to use very much in the same manner. And so that was one of the great New York Philharmonic lessons. And, um, 13 years ago, when uh, the job of senior principal of social concert master opened up with the Dallas Symphony. So, um, students, I know they hear practice, practice, practice. They're told that uh, by their teachers. I know I tell my students that uh, more than anything. But often, you know, we as music educators forget to remind parents and students how important 
concerts are, such as the concert we're having this Saturday, or even the program that we're having right now, um, live music, uh, interactive performances, how does that fit into the concept of practicing? Well, I'll quote my old teacher, Dorothy DeLay, and she used to say about practicing, you really don't know a piece of music, whether you can perform it or if you know what you're doing with it, until you've performed it on stage three times. And I think that in many ways, practicing is only part of the equation of becoming an artist. The other part of the equation, besides great teaching and listening to, to various other people, including your fellow students, is the live performance. It's inspirational. You learn a lot. I remember when I was a student in Aspen, as a matter of fact, I was, I think, about 15 years old. And I spoke with one of the great oboe players at the time um, from Europe. And he was saying, you know, I learn every time I hear the worst oboe player playing. Because it's not about so much about the quality of the performer, but it's about how they approach the performance. You learn a lot about what they do on stage, if they need to adjust to one of their colleagues. There's stuff that happens in live performance you cannot possibly learn, either in the practice room or even in the studio of your pedagogue. So if we think of the live performance as part of our education, not an extracurricular part, but actually part of the program, I think we become much more alive as artists and we know things that could work for us and then we can be more creative as artists. What a lot of students I find do is that they watch YouTube, which I watch it too. I mean, it's very important, it's, it's, it's exciting. You can see some fantastic performances. But what you can't do is you can't experience it live. There's an energy that we all feel in the concert hall when we see the artist here on stage. That is not possible when you're watching it on TV or on your screen. So the point is, make time for live performances. So just something that we have this Saturday at 2. You, to see a live performance and four performances as we'll have this Saturday, interacting with each other, working with each other, it's really scintillating. It's the only way to learn how to do that. You can't do that from listening to recordings. You can't learn that from watching videos. You need to be there. And in some ways, the, the, the wonderful part of it is that it's sort of addictive to feel that energy, much like a, a live sporting event. Once you begin to feel that adrenaline, you want to go back. And the Chamber Music Society is really one of the very best organizations in the country at providing inexpensive tickets and making sure that the families are all welcome. We have a $25 ticket, if I'm not mistaken, where your whole family can come in. I mean, you can't go to the movies for that. Um, and the bottom line is we do everything possible on a board level to welcome students, families, anyone that wants to come. And what I'm preaching here is, is Please give us a chance because I think you will really enjoy the difference between live performance and everything else.
Can, can everybody hear me? I, I'm just going to do this without the mic because it will be easier. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know these pieces, Bach wrote, I would say, more than 90% of his music that was sacred music, and this is sac secular music. So one of the things that I want to talk to you about is sound production. Now, this, this partita is, is an enormous work. It has one of the most famous works for the solo violin, the Bach Chacon, as the fifth of the, of the four movements, which she played two of them. Um, and the reason I mention that is, in some ways, the audience needs need to hear that in the first two movements as well. Your sound production, while very musical, is a little one-dimensional, and I want to talk to you about it from a technical level. When you do the opening here, when you do a... There's a lot of sort of flicking that goes on with the wrist, which kind of gets a sound that's not maybe... Well, let's put it this way. It's, it's not the, the most varied sound. It's, it's, you're getting one kind of sound, and it's very nice, but as the audience listens to it, at times it gets a little tiresome. You know? So I would consider, from, from a bow arm standpoint of view, maybe less flicking of the wrist and more using the whole arm. What if you just played a D minor scale? Better, but I still get it. Try this. The analogy that I love is, it's just like a door opening and closing. Right, so in other words, this, this area of the arm stays stable, and here, close, open. So if you did... Get much more of a line. Okay? I want to turn this way. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, when we... You know, you get to our... Now, what, whatever you're going to do, I think we need to talk in musical sentences. You know, when Bach was very unpopular, which was pretty much before Mendelssohn, they all said, well, he's an old fuddy-duddy, he writes fugues, it's boring. It can sound very motoric. So, in this piece, the first sentence is... Now, what happens with... What is all that? That's not the same as, as the before. So you want maybe... I would change color there. You know, it's something that can be very subtle. But the thing we, we talked about in the very beginning is it's difficult if your one dimension, no matter how interesting, is only the, the one thing that you have to show. You know? So if you tell the audience, yeah, I will tell you this, but then I got this to tell you, and then it goes here. Now they're going to follow what you have to say. And at times, this is something that I always think about. The idea of interpretation is not about being right or wrong. The idea of interpretation, at times, is to have an interpretation. So if you're playing music, and you know, I, I'm not that old, that I remember as a student, I sound great. This is awesome. That's very dangerous. <laughs> because if you think you sound great, and you really do sound great, then you can get very complacent. And then you're not interpreting. You're just giving them your, your one this is what I do, and it's awesome. So let's, let's hear some stories, please. Beautiful. Now, let's talk about this. And, and I, don't, I don't know if I can see and hear what you're doing, but I'm not sure it goes past the first row. So you do, you know, and it feels great out here, but I think if you ask row four, they kind of think it sounds the same. <laughs> so this is where the row speed's got to come in. You know, you don't want to play a, maybe a, maybe, so that we hear and see with your body language where you're going with this. Right there. Okay, now this is a very 
very interesting moment here. You know, you went there. But to me, you know, the harmony is, it, it, it should be a surprise. You know, you hear. I'm not suggesting you take the time. But the idea is, you got to change a, a little bit for us. And I think that's where you got to be careful that you don't just kind of go through the middle of a sentence. It becomes something like a run-on sentence, mm -hmm. as opposed to actually, okay, here's my story, I've moved, and then we turn to the left. You can do it from there. Ba -da -da -ba -ba. Again, I, I wish for a little bit more development. This, this is what I hear. However, you know, it, it needs to be a little bit logical, so I know where you're going with it. What if you were more overt about it? So in other words, the first one's less. More. Now that may seem out here, right where we're standing, that may seem really wild, right? Mm -hmm. But you gotta play for the concert hall, you know? We gotta remember that Bach didn't have a, a room this size. This may have been the biggest church he would ever play at. But we do. Mm -hmm. So we gotta be able to reach the audience. Sorry to stop, but um, this is one of those things that I, I think may be a little controversial, but I'll just throw it out at you. you your means of expression, primarily, is a lot of um, portamento. So I hear, which is a nice 19th century romantic thing, and I actually think it's very beautiful. But again, you've got to be careful about using it all the time, you know? It's like you wouldn't want to be eating chocolate all the time, or maybe you would, but... It's not so good for you. <laughs> so the idea is, what if this is molto legato suddenly? Yeah. Because if you introduce that, I mean, remember the whole piece is... Uh, so there's a lot of separate playing. Now all of a sudden you can do... Uh, you know, that's a completely different texture for the audience. Gets them involved. You know, it's, it's funny, to the layman I would say, that sounds really difficult, mm -hmm. and that's your fault. <laughs> you want it to sound really easy, and it's a very easy fix. Rhythm. You're doing a little Hungarian. You know, uh, what, what is that all about? If you were to explain to them, how is this part of the first half of the first movement of the, of, of the Anamont? I think Anamont is a dance. Uh huh. And then it's, chain, uh, it's kind of the middle of the rest, like the first part of the dance finished. Right, but it's, it sounds like two extra bars, doesn't it? Because you have a. Which has nothing to do with it. I think, in, in a way, it's almost like a postscript, right? Like in a letter of P.S. So what if you played that with a... 
that's kind of a resting place, you know, a dominant. I don't think this should be connected. Now, if you do that, you can't make that big retard so early. If you want to do a little before the chord, fine. But what you do is you're kind of telegraphing it. That's an old-fashioned word for saying, <laughs> telling the punchline before the joke, right? Mm -hmm. So make sure you don't, you, you know, if, if it's going to be, have some kind of structure, you need to know that ahead of time. Good. Now, in, in terms of, of the sound, did you think about how, how, what, what dynamic do you want there? Because it just sounds, it sounds like a... Surprise! <laughs> Maybe a... I mean, something that we know it's coming. You know, so uh, the idea in this piece, at least for me, is they have to be able to follow it. Mm -hmm. It can't feel like, well, there's a, a lot of 16th notes and some dotted rhythm, and now it's over. <laughs> you know, it, it, it needs to feel like this is a story I'm telling you, and this is where I'm going to go with it, and now it's over. Okay? okay. You want to do the next move? technique for just one second. You know, this is a tough beginning, isn't it? So you have... No. What happens is there's a lot of movement with the instrument. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a big believer in making people play, let's say, the way I play, or even the way somebody else we admire play. But where I draw the line on that is when it impedes your success as a violinist. And what happens is, if you see it... I'm not saying you quite do that, but the idea is the sounding point moves all the time and the bow moves all the time and everybody moves all the time. It feels a little like a, a wrestling match and unfortunately nobody's going to win that one. <laughs> so why don't you just, you know, try this. And in that way, you're playing where your, your instrument is. It, it's kind of in one place. You know where it's going to go. And then your job really is to speak with the bow. with that chord, you know? The hard thing about that chord is nobody knows how long it is. Right? So it's a... Where do I start? What if I... So... That's your rhythm. This is another rhythm talk. Yeah, they're not all the same. You know, uh, so... If you do a... It's actually very interesting, but it's more like a tapestry. Mm -hmm. And we really don't feel the pulse, because it keep, keeps changing on us. They're triplets, aren't they? Yeah, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. yeah.
thing about the chords too. You know, if you've ever played the Baroque bow, you can't do it. You don't want to do that. I would let it go a little bit. It's, the, the hall will help you. And that's another thing about, you know, we talked in the introduction a little bit about playing, listening to concerts and playing in a big hall. One of the great things that you learn when you play on stage a lot is to listen to the room. So I can't encourage you to, enough to listen to the room right now. You know, that open E is going to carry. You don't need to work it, you know? You know, what happens also, the short note, I don't hear enough, especially for the hall. Try one more time from the repeat. harmonic development here, it pretty much sounds exactly like everything you've played up to now. So what, what, would, what would happen if we went I mean, we need something to, to say that I'm going somewhere with this, you know? It, it, I'll tell you one thing that's really interesting. This is for everybody. The big difference about these pieces versus Beaver versus Handel is that they're incredibly imaginative. And if we sort of skim over the imagination that Bach writes into the score, we're kind of selling ourselves short because then it does sound like everybody else, mm -hmm. you know? So try not to do that. Again, the legato, I hear a lot of stuff that goes on, and I'm not sure that you, you actually realize it's kind of a habit. Yes. You know? So let's, even now, I know it's a little bit difficult, but think of the legato playing, maybe exaggerate a little bit of the, of the line, mm -hmm. more than, than the dance itself, just to get ourselves out of the habit. It's a tough shift, but you're alone. You have no idea how important that is. There's nobody to come in early. <laughs> There's no conductor who'll say, ah, that was not there. So take your time getting there. Okay, what would happen if I... I would, I would take my time getting in the last, into the last triplet because you actually don't take the time to shift properly. You're jumping into it. So... You want, you know what I do? I, it, it's just kind of a shortcut, but cor correlate this G to this G, and then it'll be a little in tune. That's it. So the idea is that the, 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 the three on the G comes first, not the bottom note. an intonation problem. <laughs> this is actually a musical problem because it just sort of hits a wall and we're not sure it's over. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, you need to figure out how are you going to end this. So let's go from the chord and figure out how we're going to end this. So, look. You come from the C sharp. It'd be so nice if you pointed that out. But you kind of blow through it, and then it feels like you're at the tip. Mm -hmm. So I would do two things. I would take my time after the chord and work your way to the middle. We have more weight, and you get more sound out of the fiddle, and you're telling them, hey, this is a culmination of something. 
because they're interested. Much better. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Um, I remember I was talking to you about when I was growing up in Russia. My dad was always a very famous double bass player, and he worked in the best symphony orchestra in Russia, uh, then the Soviet Union. And there was an opportunity to hear a concert at, at a summer music festival, which that whole orchestra went to. And I was probably three years old, and I remember hearing the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. Of course, I didn't know it was a Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto because I was just sitting on the lawn. And it was the great Russian violinist, David Oistrakh. And I remember that the sound of that violin, especially when he was tuning, I mean, he just went out in front of the orchestra and went, you know, stuff like that. And I remember thinking, that is really cool. And then by the time, for what it's worth. And by the time he finished playing that Tchaikovsky concerto, I turned to my mom and said, I want to do that. <laughs> and of course she laughed, she thought it was a crazy thing. But there was something about the sound of the violin in that man's hands, which to this day, he's one of my very favorite violinists. I, I encourage you to go and research him. It's, he's really, for a Soviet artist, which is a long talk we won't have time for tonight, he was the most universal artist because he was able to play not just the Tchaikovsky violin concerto, not just Russian music, but he was a huge proponent of new music. He was a huge um, advocate of going to the West and adopting certain Western values as a violinist, and he taught, he was a conductor, he was really a, a, a universal gentleman, if you will, of, of music, and it was something that spoke to me as a child, um, and it was all about the sound of the violin, so that's why. <laughs>
And if you play an instrument, you need to practice your instrument to the best of your ability. Once you get older, you have all these other things like you know working and paying bills and, and not getting into, 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 into trouble and things like that. It's never going to get simpler than it is now. Um, so the idea is that you want to get good practice habits right away. My practice habits when I was you know, 10 to 13 was I really liked the way I sounded. It was great. It was really exciting, and I would go in the room and play for four hours and learn about 10 minutes worth of worth of stuff. And the other, you know, two hours and 15 minutes was was really you know enjoying myself with myself, which is fine and, and really and really something you should never do. So by the time I got to college, I realized that I had a pile of music that I had to learn, and then another pile of music that I really wanted to learn. And I sort of figured out pretty quickly that. If I did what I was doing up to now, the piles were going to grow higher and higher, and my knowledge of them was going to grow lower and lower. And that sort of didn't work for me at all. So it, I tuned into the idea that, in some ways, it's all about repetition, right? So our teachers say, well, you know, if it's not working, just try it again and practice it really hard, and it's going to get much better. But when I was repeating it and just really enjoying it, I wasn't really listening to what was coming out. So in some ways, it was exactly in the same place. So it occurred to me that maybe what I should do is to ask myself at every repetition of a passage that wasn't working, you know, what exactly wasn't working and what should I try to, to, to do differently. And what the advice I have for, for you guys is, is if you can do it differently and re realize what the difference is, your brain is going to get there as opposed to just mindless repetition because that's the way it's supposed to go. So what I found is identifying the problem and making sure I was actually practicing that with some kind of a solution was 90% of getting there. And so then my same three or four hours a day were much more effective. And I was learning all that music that I, <laughs> I thought I'd never be, be able to learn. And what's exciting about that is that once you've learned the mechanics of playing it on your instrument and you can start with the interpretation of it, now you're actually an artist, and which is what we all find exciting about music. Because you know, how many people want to come in and, and, and say, you know, for two hours, here's how I play my scales, and here's how I play the arpeggios, and it's really almost in tune. You know, that's just not that exciting. However, if you have an idea, like we talked about in the master class, about a certain phrase that takes your breath away, now that is exciting. And what's great about that is it's personal, because she's never going to play it the same way as she just did for you. She's going to diff play it differently. It might be better, it might not work, it may work. But what you want is that interaction with your medium.